The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. An ancient Chinese anecdote tells of a poor man who meets a philosopher. The poor man begs for charity. The philosopher says, Look at that pebble. He points to a tiny stone. The stone turns to gold. The poor man says, May I have something bigger? The philosopher points to a rock, and it too turns to gold. The poor man again asks for something bigger. The philosopher points to a mountain. The entire mountain turns to gold. The poor man is still unhappy. Finally, the philosopher asks, What do you want? And the poor man replies, I want your finger. The moral of this and the tale you're about to hear, you can't satisfy everybody. No. No, don't, don't come near me. Please, don't. You, you'll kill me. Yes. I will. You can't get away. Don't stick me with that. It won't hurt. I, I don't want to die. I, I, I don't want to die. You should have thought of that before. You, of all people, you know, there's no such thing as the perfect crime. Oh, that's nonsense, my dear. There are hundreds, thousands, for all we know, millions of perfect crimes. Why, every unsolved murder is a perfect crime. And yours wasn't even a murder. It will look like a perfect accident. Our mystery drama, I Thought You Were Dead was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Arlene Francis. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A statement, a slogan, should never be accepted merely because it is widely held and seldom challenged. For instance, they say, dead men tell no tales. But this is not necessarily so, as many a murderer has discovered, but too late. A dead man, especially a recently dead man, can tell a veritable anthology of tales to people like doctors and detectives. But what has all this to do with Jennifer Partridge? Jennifer Partridge, sleek, slender, sophisticated Jennifer. In exactly ten seconds, the telephone will ring in Jennifer's elegant penthouse apartment, and Jennifer is going to speak to a dead man. Hello? Hello? Yes? Jennifer? Who, who is this? Jennifer. Do you have to ask? But, but... It isn't. It can't be. It is, Jennifer. It is. No. No. What's the matter with me? I... I... I'm... Oh, it couldn't have been. I... It's crazy. How could it be, Scott? I, I, I won't answer it. I won't. Yes, I will. Now listen here. What kind of obscene practical joke do you think this will... Jennifer! Oh. Oh, Paul. Now, what was that all about? Oh, some idiot. Look, is everything all right? Everything's fine. You sure? Yes, I'm positive. I called because I find I have to cancel your appointment for tomorrow afternoon. I... <sighs> I'll have to leave town for a few days. When can we schedule another appointment for you? 
when? Well, I know how busy you are. How... How about tonight? Tonight? Right now. Um, let me see. Well, perhaps Please, I can... Paul. Suppose I come to your place. Yes, Paul. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Paul. Oh... The best thing is not to answer. Uh, oh, Martin. Martin was supposed to call at 7.30. Yes, it must be Martin. <laughs> Hello, Martin. Hello? So, it's Martin. See here. Wh whoever you are. You know who I am. Martin's a moron. Yes, he's rich, but he's a moron. <laughs> Do you mean you actually murdered me for Martin? Uh, I, you did, you know. I, I didn't murder you. Oh, that voice. <laughs> the tremor in that golden voice. I can almost see the teardrops beginning to well in the corners. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Scott. I'm your husband. And your place is with me. But you're dead. Exactly. Exactly. But Scott is dead. I spoke with him. Twice. It isn't possible. Paul, I know Scott's voice. A practical joker. Someone could imitate Scott's voice, perhaps, but... But what? But, but not the way Scott talks. The way he forms those, those sentences. He has that, that whole... Circular way of... The way Scott talks, how he forms sentences, he has that circular way. You realize you're using the present tense. Because I just heard his voice. And I'm sure you did. Well, finally. In your mind. Oh, I see. I imagined it. That's what you're implying. Well, there are all kinds of technical terms we might use to describe this phenomenon. But imagination is as good a word as any, and it really tells the story. But I heard the phone ring. I answered it. It was Scott, and I hung up. Yes, Jennifer. Oh, please. No patronizing, please. You and Scott. The love match of the century. Of course, you miss him, and so... And so? What? And so you actually did hear the phone ring. You actually did hear Scott. And what did Scott say? He accused me of murdering him. Well, did you? Did I what? Do you think you murdered Scott? You were there when Scott was killed. You know how Scott was killed. How can you ask if I killed him? I didn't ask you if you killed him. I asked you if you think you killed him. It was an accident. I wasn't even there. That's not the issue. Perhaps you're thinking if you had been more diligent, more devoted, Scott might not have been there either. I am trying to tell you, Paul. Did that... the better one die? Now, in the year that Scott's been dead. How many stories have you sold? Well, I... I... I haven't really been trying to... Before you married Scott and began the famous Scott and Jennifer Partridge collaboration, how many stories had you ever sold on your own? Well, I... I'm having a... It's a case of block. Writer's block. It happens now and then. But you are writing. And Martin tells me he's having trouble. Editors complain something seems to be missing. People are starting to talk. Was Scott the real creative talent of the team? It's a lie. Now, you may be one of America's top psychiatrists, but you are still a male chauvinist. You consider the fact of a man and woman writing team, and what is your automatic reaction? The man is the one who is the true talent. I'm only trying to tell Never you... Never mind that just now. Let's consider what I'm trying to tell you. Yes? I, I'm trying to tell you I heard Scott's voice on the telephone. Scott called me on the telephone. And I am trying to tell you why you think... Well, who could that be? Now, go ahead, answer it. I, I... Hello? Hello. Doing anything, Jennifer? I thought we'd chat. Just a minute. Paul, it's Scott. Pick up the extension. You'll see it's Scott.
There's no one on the line. It's just a dial tone. But it was Scott. He hung up. He didn't want you to hear him. But he spoke to me. He spoke to me. Jennifer, he's dead. Is that a fact? But I tell you... Is it a fact, yes or no? Yes. Then these conversations can only be taking place in your mind. But it seems so real. So real. He looked uh, deep into her eyes, into those smoldering, passionate eyes, uh, and he knew. Now he knew. He knew how it could be possible for a man to sacrifice his honor, uh, his career, his country. You have that, Miss Kewlett? Yes, Mrs. Partridge. To please read it back. He looked deep into her eyes, into those smoldering, passionate... Wait. The whole passage, it sounds familiar. It sounds as if... Yes, Mrs. Partridge, now that you mention it... Why should it sound familiar? You, you and Mr. Partridge had written that same paragraph five years ago in Dead Man's Marriage. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. I simply have to get away from eyes. That was Scott's trick. Uh, may I come in? Absolutely not. I'm working. How's it coming? Splendidly. Level with me? Atrociously. I think you're trying too hard. Well, what does that mean? Just relax. What does St. Clair think of the Merry Christmas caper? He thinks you're trying too hard. But I simply must... You simply must what? Get something published this year. Why? Isn't it obvious? People will say that Scott was the writer. I don't know anyone who's saying that. But it's true. Now, look, Jennifer, honey, just relax. You're nervous, high strung. <laughs> just like a thoroughbred. No, thank you. It's flattering to be compared with a horse. Well, baby, you can compare an agent with a trainer. They both have to nurse some very temperamental stock. Tell you what we should do. Take three months off. Get married, go on a cruise. Martin, darling, we can't get married until I get something of my own published. Okay, okay. I know you understand, darling. I understand. I'm not going to win arguments with you, so I came with a suggestion. Yes? People have worked together so closely, so long as you and Scott become dependent on each other. But I'm trying to prove Maybe that Maybe I... sometimes you just got to listen. Because Scott died so suddenly, the break was so... Well, it was too abrupt, you know what I mean? You weren't prepared for it. Now, let Scott help you. What? What are you saying? The day Scott died, he told me he had just done a kind of treatment for a book called I Thought You Were Dead. What? You know how he was? He'd fill up a whole yellow pad with a storyline. Well... He said he just did something called I Thought You Were Dead. Why not finish it? I don't know what you're talking about. What? You mean you're not aware of the story? No. Scott never discussed it with me. But he said he had written 11 yellow pages. He had the whole plot. Miss Kewler? Uh, yes? Have you seen 11 yellow pages? You know, the kind Mr. Partridge would do by hand. Oh, no, Mrs. Partridge. Yeah. But Scott said he wrote it up. Are you sure you haven't seen him, Miss Kewlett? No, sir. And I generally know where everything is. Jennifer, you have to write it. But, Martin... Look, this whole thing is psychological. For years, you and Scott worked together. He became a habit with you. Well, not everybody can quit a habit cold turkey, so... Move away from him gradually. See what I mean? But we, we don't even know where the outline is. It has to be in the house. We'll turn the place inside out and upside down. We'll find those 11 yellow pages. Now, let's start looking. I can tell you, Martin, no one will ever find them. Because long ago, they had been reduced to ashes. No earthly power can ever recreate them into Scott's original yellow pages. I burned them, destroyed them completely. I had to. Because otherwise, people might discover how I murdered Scott. The 
Partridges, Scott and Jennifer. Year after year, best-selling novels and award-winning stories would stream from their typewriter. Why should she murder the source of all her wealth? Why? Simple. Didn't you ever hear the story of the goose that laid the golden eggs? We'll have some interesting little nuggets for you when I return shortly with Act Two. Yesterday, the phone rang, and Jennifer Partridge answered it. It was her husband, Scott. They chatted briefly, and then Jennifer hung up. But everyone knows that Scott has been dead for over a year. Of course, what everyone doesn't know is that Jennifer murdered him. The sun rose, finally. At first, a pale rose glow on the distant eastern horizon. No, no distant eastern horizon. What an indigestible mouthful that is. Damn. Ugh. Descriptive narrative came so easily to Scott. Why do I have to worry about the sun rising in the distant eastern horizon? I'll just say, uh, the next day. The next day. Ugh, that's so abrupt. Say, don't you hear that damn phone, Miss Kewlett? But, Mrs. Partridge, you always insist on answering the phone yourself. Pick it up. Well, yes, ma'am. Hello? Hello, is that you, Miss Kewlett? Yes, sir. Is Miss Partridge there? Mr. Evans, are you here, Mrs. Partridge? No. No, Mr. Evans. Mrs. Partridge has gone out this morning. Tell her to get on the phone. But she isn't here. Tell her I have news from St. Clair. He has news from Mr. St. Clair, Mrs. Partridge. All right, I'll take it on my extension. Yes, Martin. Oh, I see you came back. Martin, I do not like to be disturbed while I'm working. What are you working on? Something new. Drop it. What? I had breakfast with St. Clair. Martin. I told him you found an outline Scott had prepared before he died. But I didn't find it. I told him the title. I thought you were dead. St. Clair flipped. But I don't know anything about it. He a contract. But, uh... He's been on the phone to the West Coast. Uh... How do I know? Go ahead, ask me. Martin, you must I listen. I already got a call from one studio. And you know what time it is out there? Seven o'clock in the morning. Martin, I haven't found the story. Honey, you find it. The bidding has begun, and it's already gone past one million bucks. You mean between you and that Miss Cuda, you can't find that story? Drop what you're doing and look, but you'll find those 11 pages. Martin. Oh, Martin. Uh, I, uh, I, I've looked everywhere, Mrs. Partridge, but I was unable to... Yes, find... well, we'll just have to keep at it. Now, where were we? Oh, the um, opening paragraph, the sun rose. No, make that the next day. I... Oh, I don't know. I'm in no mood to... I can tell this is going to be one of those mornings. Look, Miss Kewlett, wh- why don't you take some time off? Drive into town. I could look for those 11 pages. Where? We've just about torn the whole place apart. Well, then why don't I dust and clean some of Mr. Partridge's trophies and things? Uh, if you like. Some of the guns and knives should be oiled. Well, make sure you're very careful. Actually, we should have a gunsmith or someone like that. Oh, I don't mind it at all, Mrs. Partridge, and I know how to do it. Very well. Uh, tell Mrs. Mason to have lunch ready at 12, and that could give us a long afternoon for work. Yes, Mrs. Partridge. I... I really don't understand it. What's that? Mr. Partridge, he was such a methodical man... You know, a, a place for everything and everything in his place. Yes, I remember that little homey cliche used to drive me wild sometimes. Now, every time he would finish writing his notes or whatever on his yellow pad, he would always tear off the pages and put them in his right-hand desk drawer. Yes, well, they must be around somewhere. But it's so unusual. I've looked everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, you recall the Edgar Allan Poe story about the missing letter? was in the middle of the room in full view all the time. I'm sure that's what we're dealing with here, too. Yes, Mrs. Partridge. Oh. Oh, all right. 
all right. I, I'm not afraid. I... Uh... Hello? Hello, darling. Scott? Yes, darling. It's Scott. Who... Who are you? What do you hope to gain by... Dearest, I miss you. What are you after? Uh, have you won the Nobel Prize for Literature yet? <laughs> now you're listening. Now you're willing to believe. I am not willing to Who believe. But Scott would know. I... I held you back, yes. I kept you from expressing your genius. <laughs> I restricted you to trivial little detective pot boilers. I made you fritter <laughs> away your talent. Scott... <laughs> Well, express. Express yourself. Oh, you fool. You adorable fool. Neither of us can make it without the other. All right. Whoever you are, you have a game. You want something. What is it? I want you, Jennifer. I love you. We were so good together in every way. What do you want? You refuse to believe I'm Scott. Look, now, you caught me off guard yesterday, and I was feeling low. But today, today I can laugh at a practical joke, even even, even if it is in horrible taste. Do you want me to prove I'm Scott? How could you prove? Who but Scott would know why you destroyed my yellow page outline. Ah, uh, you're listening. You're listening now, aren't you? I, I don't even know. I don't know what outline you're talking about. How she kills her husband. And I left it lying around. I didn't think you'd use it to kill me. But I, 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 I didn't... Well, it doesn't matter now, darling. It doesn't matter. I've already forgiven you. We need each other. We're incomplete apart. I can't come to you. No. Therefore... You must come to me. I, I didn't kill you. Must I tell you how no. you killed me? No. Perhaps I'd better. No. You seem to have forgotten. Please. That morning, I had a date to go duck hunting with Paul no. and Martin. And oh, no. No, don't. And I took the 12-gauge. And... No. No. You know you have to answer, darling. You know. Don't ever hang up on me again. I'll keep calling back. Now I must tell you how I died. No, I... I, I, I I'm just losing my mind. But that morning, before I left home, you inserted a little transparent plastic ring down the barrel in front of the chamber. And so when I... No! When I pulled the trigger... Naturally, the gun exploded in my face. No, no, no! <laughs> Miss Kulet found you lying on the floor. Oh, it's Scott, Paul, I tell you, it, 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 it's Scott. Jennifer, <gasps> I think you need a rest. Of course I do, but that won't solve the problem. Now, please, stop fighting me. I can't indulge you in this... This childish fantasy. But then let me tell you why it is Scott. W well, just listen. Not only is it Scott's voice. Which an actor can imitate. But it is Scott's diction, his idiom. Also well known from Scott's writing and broadcast. But, but there are things that were known only to Scott and me. How we, how we felt about our writing and the quarrels that we had and even... Yes? Even... Uh, an outline that no one else could know about. Well, I knew about it. Scott mentioned it to me and to Martin that morning. Well, you two. You were the only ones who knew. All right, Jennifer. Let's face it. These conversations, they really are taking place, but in your mind. Paul, you simply have to believe that Scott is on the telephone. Guilt and remorse. First, you thought Scott was holding you back, getting a free ride on your talent. I never said... You're talking to me, Jennifer. You wanted to be free of him, an accident happened. Scott was killed. Your wish came true. I never wanted Scott to Not be killed. Not consciously. Never. But when he died, that wish did come true. But you were wrong. You can't work without Scott. But I spoke to Scott. I'll tell you who's on the other end of that phone. 
I'll tell you to whom you're speaking. Yep. To your guilty conscience. Admit it. And then face it and fight it. I can write without Scott. You believe it, don't you, Paul? I mean, you do you believe it? Of course you can. But you can't work here, not in this house. Why? Well, this isn't a home, it's a museum. Every room is dedicated to Scott. Weapons, souvenirs, pictures. Uh, you, Scott always insisted on having the things he wrote about in front of us all the time. If, if we were going to poison someone, we'd uh, we'd have that bottle in front of us with the poison in it, and, and uh, we'd fill the bottle, and we'd make it mean something dynamic. And that's why we have all these things, all these spears and these knives and these guns and, these, and everything. I agree. Realism is great. But get rid of everything in this house that you can associate with Scott. I, I still love Scott. Clear the house of all this junk. But how can I part with the things that have... You'll never be free of Scott as long as everything around you reminds you of Scott. Oh. Well. Maybe, Paul. You may just have something. Another thing. You might get rid of Miss Cuett. Miss Cuett? But she's a perfect gem. And she's one of the reasons you're trying too hard. Miss Cuett? Why, most of the time I hardly know she's... She's there. Well, I'm afraid, subconsciously, you're thinking she's comparing you with Scott. Oh, that's true. That is true, and I never thought of it. But, I mean, she, she's given us ten faithful years. How do I... I know, I'll, I'll tell her I'm going on a, on a long trip. And, uh, and I'll give her a year's pay. Two years' pay. Be generous and be kind. Just remember, for years now, she's had no other life. Now, what's this? What makes Miss Cullet think her employer can't fire her? To say I have no intention of leaving this house. Meek, Miss Cullet? We will have to hear some more from Miss Cullet before we can properly evaluate this latest development. And we shall when I return shortly with Act Three. For ten years, mild, modest, and self-effacing Miss Cullet has been secretary to the Partridges, Scott and Jennifer. Now Jennifer's doctor has ordered Jennifer to revamp her entire life. Get rid of everything that could remind her of Scott. Everything and everyone. But the most astounding thing has just happened. Mousy Miss Cullet refuses to be fired. I am not sure I heard what you said, Miss Cullet. I said I have no intention of leaving this house. That outline Mr. Partridge wrote, those 11 pages of handwritten notes. Well, I found them. You... Found them? Yes, Mrs. Partridge. But that's, uh, that's... Impossible? Were you going to say impossible? I... Uh... I know. You destroyed them. But I found them before you burned them. And I made a copy. I see. What do you want, Miss Kill? The notes explain how a man was killed when his wife tampered with the chamber of his shotgun. That's not proof that I... Let's think for a minute and decide what it is. Your husband's shotgun exploded in his face, killing him. He had written a story explaining how it could be done. You tried to destroy that story. I will testify that you and he fought... We had the normal disagreements any husband and wife had. For ten years, I sat in this office like another chair, a piece of furniture. The invisible Miss Cullet. I was a machine and took down everything each of you said, and you said everything in front of me, everything, as if I didn't exist. What do you want? I want things as they are right now. I don't know what that means. I want you to keep living in fear, filled with fright, worrying, wondering what I'm going to do about you. That's all you want? It's enough. Why? Why? What did I ever do to you? What did you ever do to me? Oh, how dare you ask that? I ask because I don't know. You killed the man I loved. The man you loved? You killed 
Scott Partridge. He didn't even know you were alive. Does that matter? Can you live without the sun? Does the sun know you're alive? You loved Scott. Love? Oh, what a weak, fragile word. I adored him. I worshipped him. And you killed him. You killed him. I don't believe you. Why did I stay here all these years? Uh. Yes? What's that, Mrs. Mason? The moving men? To do what? Oh, no. No, there must be some mistake. I will ask Mrs. Partridge. Mrs. Partridge, Mrs. Mason says movers are here to take away all of Mr. Partridge's things. Is that true? Yes. Oh, no. No, I won't permit it. Mrs. Mason, dismiss those men. Mrs. Partridge has just changed her mind. Now, see here, Miss Kulin. I'll bring those notes to the police station. I swear you threatened to kill him. Nothing, nothing in this house must ever be changed. Do you understand? This place, it must remain a shrine to his memory. <laughs> put some notes together and I, I just must have fallen asleep. But what what are you doing here? Well, I happen to be in the neighborhood. I thought I'd stop in and check on you. Um, now, Jennifer, uh, what's the meaning of all this? I, all what? Well, I thought we'd agreed to transform this house from a, a museum, from a memorial to Scott, into a home for you. Um, well, and, uh, Miss Kulet. Mm. She's downstairs cleaning a revolver. Why is she still here? Uh, because. Yes, because? Uh, because that's how I want it. Something's not right. Mm. The way Miss Kulet smiled at me when I came in here today. No, ah, yes, Miss Kulet. As if she knows something. Mm. But that's not what I find strange. Oh, Miss Kulet. Miss Kulet hidden facets in Miss Kulet. It's not so much that I noticed the smile. It's not the uh, fact... It's the fact that I noticed Miss Kulet. That's it. I noticed Miss Kulet. Jennifer, why didn't you fire her? Because I chose to keep her. There's something about that woman. I'll deal with Miss Kulet. What does that mean? Let, 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 let me go back to work. Hmm? Jennifer, the waste basket is overflowing. Yeah, I'm going to keep trying. We'll try to analyze your problem. <laughs> what's blocking you? Do what Scott would do. Don't you dare mention his name. Learn from Scott. When faced with a problem, how would Scott approach it? Scott. Scott would say three magic words. And what were they? Who, why, how... Who, why, how. Every good story must have a strong who, a logical why, a believable how. That's the telephone. Shall I answer? No. Because if you answer, there'll be no one on the other end. Let me... Hello. Hello, darling. Scott. Jennifer, it can't be Scott. How is the writing coming, darling? Who? Why? How? Jennifer, you know the how. It's Scott's voice on the phone. Now discover the who and the why. 
the who and the why. What was that, darling? The who and the why. You remember who, why, and how, don't you, Scott? Uh, dearest, I don't remember. Yes. Uh, you are a phony, and the little game is over, and it nearly destroyed my mind, but no more. Miss Kewlett, I would like you to take some dictation. I found another outline Mr. Partridge had done some time ago. Oh? Are you ready? Oh, yes, indeed. He calls this, If I loved you twice as much, you'd be half as dead. Oh, poor darling, Mr. Partridge. He would <laughs> always begin every treatment with a joke. Mm. Now he sets it up. Husband... Wife, secretary. Secretary idolizes husband. Husband idolizes wife. Wife hates husband. Wife murders husband. Are you getting all this? Oh, yes, yes. Secretary decides to drive wife insane. Secretary hires act. Uh, to impersonate husband's voice on phone. He wrote that? Secretary knows all the inside intimate details of husband-wife relationship. Coaches actor so he can sound authentic. Yes. Wife believes actor is husband until... Until what? Don't you know? How would I know? Until wife discovers secretary is behind it all. Then. Then what? Then wife kills secretary. How? Like this. <gasps> no. Don't touch me with that. Don't touch me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, get me to a doctor. You. You. Killed me? Of course. This dart, the tip is covered with... I know. I know. Oh, please. Call the doctor. I, I'm getting dizzy. I, Poison. I... Oh. Curare. Scott and I used it as a gimmick in our South American jungle mystery. Please call the doctor. He could do nothing for you now, you little oh. fool. It was a good try. You did hire an excellent actor. I compliment you. I didn't hire anyone. Forget it. But I... I didn't. I didn't. What do you mean you didn't hire anyone? Who else if it wasn't you? It wasn't me. Yes. Then who? Why? How? Miss Kewlett! Miss Kewlett! Answer me! <laughs> Hello? Darling. No, no. Why did you kill her, poor thing? I, oh, please. Who? Who are you? Who else could I be? Scott? No. Scott. Darling, you killed so quickly for such trivial reasons. Poor girl, she have done you no harm. Me? Couldn't you be generous enough to share part of the fame with me? God, if, if I could only do it over again. You do everything the same way. It's how you're made. God, Scott, what's going to happen to me? You can't make it on your own, sweetheart. You need me. God, I need you so badly. Mm. Darling, you know the pills we used in Murder of the Fun? No. No. Just one pill. You'll go quickly, no. easily, no pain. You'll just fall quietly, pleasantly asleep. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'll bow you with you. Now, put the phone down. You'll still hear my voice. Yes. The bottle is on the shelf. That's right. Open it. Fine, fine. Take one pill, one smooth little red-coated pill. 
I'll place it in your mouth. Mm. That's a fine, fine peppermint taste. It's so refreshing. Now, sit in the easy chair. Oh, Scott. I'm, I'm so sleepy. Now, close your eyes, dear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And soon mm-hmm. we'll be together again. Mm-hmm. Scott? Hello, darling. Hello. And hopefully they are together again. Not just the two of them, but the three of them. After all, they need Miss Kulet, too. And they're probably writing mysteries upstairs for the heavenly version of Mystery Theater. So when you go to your just reward, you won't have to miss your favorite program. Well, tonight we did more than just entertain you. We also taught you one of the tricks of the trade. Who, why, how. Those are the three magic words. Our cast included Arlene Francis, Mary Jane Higby, Robert Dryden, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 